as a pet parent, sometimes we find ourselves in this cycle, in this loop of going back and forth to the vet over and over and over and over again. We have something going on with our pet. We know there is something going on. We're doing everything our vet is telling us to do, but our pet isn't getting better. We just know there is something else out there. Obviously, you're listening to me, so you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about pet health coaches, <laughs> and I've told you guys a little bit about what I do, but why I'm so excited for today's guest is because she is also a pet health coach. I have a very, very, very special guest with you today because she is someone that I actually got to meet in person. We don't live that far away from each other, and it was just like crazy how the universe puts like people together because this idea of pet health coaches is actually relatively new. And she is the only other one that I had ever met that had the title of pet health coach. And I was like, yes, I need to meet you. And I had to introduce her to you as well. Well, her name is Jody Teich and she is not only a pet health coach. She's also a human health coach. And she is, has created her own Taish wellness group. But what's really cool is that she's also a podcast host. She hosts the Pet Health Coach on Pet Life Radio. Welcome, Jody Taish. Thank you so much, Jessica. I'm so excited to be on your podcast. Me too. So it's been a little while in the making, but we finally made it work. So... I have told my audience a little bit about what I do as a pet health coach, but I'm interested in your story, like how you got to where you are, what you do as a pet health coach, and kind of, I feel like you can really tie that in with human health coaching as well. Like, do you have a lot of people that you do both for? <laughs> there are definitely clients I have where I'm their health coach. And I'm also their pet's health coach. And they each have separate sessions. And, you know, they have to book for both of them. <laughs> so absolutely, because we're so connected to our pets. And our pets are so intuitive. So how we are, how we look about, you know, look at health, how we care for ourselves is has a lot to do with also how we look at health for our pets and how we're going to care for them. So I find it's very connected and I find it's very synergistic when I do have a human, I call them my human clients and then my pet clients in the same household. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what is your journey? What was that like? What brought you to become both a human health coach and a pet health coach? Yeah. I have always been interested in medicine. Um, I wanted to be a vet when I was a little girl and got sidetracked. Um, and early adopter to sort of the health food store, the very first health food stores in the 1970s. And so when I was at camp, I would get the care packages with the Barbara's seed cookies instead of the sugar daddies. <laughs> And, you know, I kind of just grew up like that. Um, so that was always on my radar. But when my daughter was three and we were in the local library in New York, um, I literally looked up on the shelves and there were two books next to each other. One was Medicinal Plants and the other was An Introduction to Homeopathy. And I reached up and just pulled the homeopathic book down. I started leaping through it. I started reading it. I was fascinated. I took it out. I read it cover to cover, bought my own copy, and then sent away from my homeopathic kit to Washington, D.C., where the homeopathic, like American Homeopathic Institute was back then. And this was like 34 years ago, 35 years ago. But I raised my daughter and our animals um, and my husband and my friends um, using homeopathy. And the reason is I had a pivotal experience the very next year when Morgan was four. The three generations of girls were on vacation in Florida. So that's my mom, me, and Morgan. And Morgan, as soon as we arrived, she came down with this like blazing ear infection. 
and she was miserable. And I went to a pediatrician in Florida. I got the antibiotic. I put it in the refrigerator. I reached out to my homeopath because I was still relatively green. Um, We talked and worked together, figured out a remedy. I got it. My mom and I stayed up with Morgan all night after we gave it to her. And the next morning, her fever broke. And by the next afternoon, she was running around like a normal four-year-old. And that was wonderful because it was like resolved so quickly. I never had to use the antibiotic, but she never got another ear infection. And it's been 35 years. No, for Morgan, 33 years. My nephews, on the other hand, it was always ear infection, antibiotic, ear infection, antibiotic, then tubes in the ears. This was their childhood experience, not my daughter. So that was pivotal for me. And that was a game changer. And I was convinced. And it started me on a journey with homeopathy, which was part and parcel with the natural healing that I love, the nutrition and and everything else. So after being a, a publicist in the entertainment industry for 30 years in New York, very different. Um, when I retired, I got involved in the pet space and I had a couple of different, you know, sort of uh, mini careers in the pet space. I love fashion. So I was involved in pet fashion as a, as a designer and manufacturer of high-end pet clothing. Um, and then that pivoted to a blog about living stylishly with your dog and rescue because I was very into rescue called Bark and Swagger. And then I just said, you know what, Jody, you love medicine, natural healing. You love animals. Why don't you just put the two together? And that's what I ultimately did. So that's how the pet health coach came around. That's how originally the hound healer came around. And, um, and here I am today, you know, I, it morphed into me being certified as a human health coach, certified in nutrition for dogs, um, certified as a pet homeopathic educator and, um, and launching my pet and human health coaching practice. Wow. And oh (laughs) my goodness, your daughter, I hope she knows how lucky she is. I know like that was what you were talking about with your nephews, that was me as a kid. I was just ear infection after ear infection. Like it was so bad. I got tubes. I had my adenoids out, like all of the things. And I probably spent the first six years of my life on antibiotics. And here I am, you know, I'm 40 years old and I'm still trying to fix it all. (laughs) Yes. Well, that's how I lived my life. Six years on antibiotics is takes a long time And, you know, conceivably, unless by the time you were seven, you were eating beautifully and supporting your gut microbiome, which most people don't, don't know at that age. And most parents don't know back then, you know, it's, it's years of just feeding the damage. So yes, I understand that. And I feel, I feel for you. We're all fixing stuff. Nobody was perfect growing up, but yes, yes. For sure. So Okay. Homeopathy is fascinating to me, though I have not dug into it all that much. I understand it a little bit and I can, I I can kind of fumble my way around enough for myself that I would be comfortable giving myself something. But (laughs) for anybody listening in the audience who is like, I've heard that word. What is that? Can you explain a little bit about what homeopathy actually is? Absolutely. I am a total geek about energy medicine and homeopathy is right there in the middle. Um, As an energy medicine, it is probably the hardest thing for people to wrap their heads around. And the reason why it's gotten such a bad rap in recent years, the reason why it originally started to get a bad rap is a whole other story, is because whatever substance the medicine is made out of, whether it's plant, mineral, or animal, the actual original substance 
at a certain point is no longer there. It's not discernible anymore. It's the energy of it. And the way that happens is, and the thing that's left out in the media so much when they're, you know, like denigrating homeopathy is yes, to make something homeopathic, it is diluted again and again and again and again and so on and so forth. But after every dilution, it is what we call succussed, rapidly banged against something. Now it's done with machines. Back in the late 1700s, early 1800s, when Dr. Samuel Hahnemann discovered it, they there were lots of stories that went around. They said it was against his Bible. He was frustrated and he was just <laughs> banging it against his Bible. Some said it was in the saddlebags on the horses. Um, but it has to be succussed rapidly because what that does is it releases the energy of the substance into the liquid of the dilution. And it is that repeated diluting and succussing, releasing more and more energy that energizes that water. It's really, it's, it's a distilled or filtered water and alcohol mixture that then is coated on the outside of those little sugar pellets, sucrose pellets. The coating is the medicine. And the way it actually works, that's how it's made and how it's energized and it's just the energy of it. But when you take a case and you take all the symptoms down and you go deep, you talk about the mind symptoms, you talk about the modalities, what makes it better, worse, how is that individual pet or person exhibiting their vomiting and diarrhea? Because you could have two dogs with vomiting and diarrhea. One is vomiting immediately after eating. The other one is vomiting hours later. One is drinking a lot of water. The other is thirstless. One wants to be out in the open air. The other one wants to be under the covers in the warmth. One wants to be close to you. The other one wants to distance. They express that vomiting and diarrhea individually. Just their way. And when you get those symptoms down, and you look in the repertory and you get the remedies that match as closely as possible with those symptoms. As you train more and more, you learn which symptoms are the important ones. Um, you then have, I always have my number one, two, and three remedy, but you have that number one remedy that most closely matches the key complaint, the chief complaint key symptom, and then the other symptoms that are make a complete symptom picture. And if it's the right one, the energy of that medicine in a healthy person will create those symptoms. In a person or animal that has those symptoms, that energy, if you choose the right potency and dosing, it will overpower the energy of those symptoms in the body. Those will one by one fall away and then the energy of the remedy will dissipate and go away. And you're left with an animal whose symptoms are disappearing one by one. It is absolutely fascinating. It is, it is not a simple form of medicine to learn. You could spend a lifetime studying and still never know everything about homeopathy because it's complex. But for acute things, Knowing the basics, which is what I've taught my students um, when, I, when I've taught my homeopathy course, you can treat at home successfully. And I have examples of students who have gone on to do beautiful things with their animals on their own from what they've learned about the basics of homeopathy. So it's powerful, yet gentle, and um, it is a, it's a beautiful energy medicine to learn. And hopefully that explained it a little bit better. Yeah, I, I think it's a very, really good explanation. I think probably better than I've heard before. Um, so right. do you think, I, I, as you were describing that, it made me wonder, do you think, is it easier with humans or animals? Because I could see question. where like. Yeah, it's a great question. The big differentiator is 
the humans can tell us what they're feeling, what happens when these symptoms come up. We can ease more easily discern those maybe strange, rare, and peculiar symptoms that are sometimes a guiding symptom in choosing the right remedy. Animals can't tell us. We have to use our powers of observation. We have to be a detective for our animals, which I teach my pet parent clients anyway. Being a detective for your animals is so important. It, it's You know them better than anyone, and you will know when something is off. So that's how we do homeopathy with animals is we notice what's different. We notice what they're doing differently with this acute illness. Or if it's chronic, we have to take that whole big picture case. We notice what their personalities are like. We know them. You know, what are their tendencies? What are their symptoms? What goes a little bit deeper that we know about them? So yes, that's the big differentiator. It's easier with people for that reason. Um, but, you know, sometimes you have a hard case with humans and sometimes you have a hard case with animals and vice versa. Yeah, well, that's what I was thinking. Like, I in, in working with people, you would on this with homeopathy, you would know better. That's why I was curious because I I was thinking like me, I could probably tell you in much more detail what my dog's symptoms are because I'm like very very aware if she's you know panting heavier than normal. Like I yeah. I, I just see that in in her and. But with myself, I feel like I would, you know, brush things off or not pay attention to certain things. And because it's me, like, I, I feel like I would be better at <laughs> telling you what's going on with my dog. I get it. We are very animal focused. But as someone who practices homeopathy and does have, you know, and does have human clients, um, it's up to me to ask the high mileage questions. It's up to me to ask the kind of questions of you, my client, to get you to think a little bit deeper and to remember, oh, right, I yes, I, I am experiencing this, or yes, I did feel that. So that is where it's kind of like this dance, right? Um, and we both play our part. So you know, this was a very interesting question for, for those of you listening. Um, Jody also had me on her podcast and she asked me this question and I, and I thought it would be a really great question to ask you as well on my podcast. What do you see the role of the a pet health coach as, and how do you think it fits in with, you know, what pet parents are doing today? Yeah. Well, and I think it is a really good and important question, and it can't be explained enough because we are new to this party. Um, people are wrapping their heads around human health coaching. Yes, in New York, LA, Chicago, you know, places where maybe it's more prevalent. Certainly New York, where people are more, I can say this because I'm a New Yorker, people are more neurotic and everybody has a health coach. Um, probably LA too. <laughs> but in other places around the country and the world, uh, it is still relatively a new concept. So pet health coaching is very new, but I definitely see similarities between the two and differences. And the similarities are a pet health coach is your champion. We are like the quarterback helping you run the ball down the field from where you are to your goals, your health goals. Same with your pets. Um, we are a guide. We know more than the average pet parent. So we are a great resource person, knowledge transfer person. Um, we can suggest from experience things to do, certainly with you and I, from a nutritional standpoint, the foundation of the house, that often is all it takes to make a huge difference in an animal's life. Same with people. Um, and... We are also a bridge between the pet parent and the vet. Vets are important. I'm not a doctor. You're not a doctor. We can't profess to be doctors. 
we're not here to diagnose. Um, what we can do is be a great sounding board and supplemental uh, team player with the vet. Vets are great for diagnostics. Vets are great for ER, God forbid. Vets are great for surgery. But they're not taught preventative and curative methods and medicine in med school. And that's the sad thing. Um, and the little teeny weeny bit that they're taught about nutrition is sponsored by Hills. That's who pays for that teeny weeny bit. So they're indoctrinated very, very early on while they're still in school to be a part of the Hills family. Um, and that's why when we go into many, many vets offices, we'll see Hills and um, Purina and, you know, those types of foods and why vets steer pet parents to the ID diets for special diets for foods um, for their pets. So those are the similarities, the differences that I noticed because in my education to be a human health coach, it is drummed into our heads at the integrated at the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, which is an amazing human health coaching uh, program school in New York. Um, that we do not diagnose, we are not doctors. You know, we are probably the most important thing we do is active listening and helping our clients go deeper into themselves to find the answers that they already have inside. With pets, they can't speak. And pet parents are looking, some desperately that have been wrestling with a condition for years and seeing their pets suffer and suffering along with them, they're looking for answers. And because we do have training in certain areas, we can, and areas that their vets don't, we can suggest. And as you talked about on my podcast, when a pet parent listens and follows the program and sticks with it, stays with us, um, results do happen and beautiful things can happen as, as you shared with my audience, um, with your that pit mix with terrible skin issues that now is, is healed. Um, so that's basically how I see a pet health coach and sort of the differences between human and animal health coaching. Yeah. Yeah, it, it really is that, that bridge <laughs> that, that you're talking about, I think. And so new, so, so new. <laughs> we have to educate uh, pet parents on what we do because we they do. don't even know that they need a health coach, but yeah. when they work with one boy, they are very, very happy. Yes. You know, and and we have them. to we have to educate veterinarians too. I have gotten yeah. more pushback from veterinarians that um just don't see. I, I don't know if they're threatened or think that we want to be veterinarian. I don't want to be a veterinarian. <laughs> no, me either. Me either. Um yeah, I'm not sure exactly what it is. I'm I'm sure there are lots of different reasons. But so if we could touch kind of touch back a little bit on homeopathy but tie it in to pet health coaching is that kind of like is it a, is it a main focus of what you do or is it very individualized how do you you know how do you, obviously you and I have talked about this before but yeah I'm very very big into in, you know very individual everybody's an individual we need to plan everything out individually. And, and there may be supplements that I absolutely love, 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 but I'm not going to recommend them for X dog, right? Even though I love them, it's just not right yes. for that animal. So yes. is, is homeopathy like a big part of what you do? Is that like a big differentiating factor that you have? It's not, it's a big part of my life. It's not a big part of what I do in that Bioindividuality is key. Um, there are two tenets of coaching that are at the foundation of my training, bioindividuality and multidimensional coaching. And multidimensional coaching means 
body, mind, spirit, um, mental health. Um, it's everything. And it's the primary food, which has nothing to do with the food on your plate, but has everything to do with your life and all the facets of it and how you're living it. And the secondary food, the food that's on your plate that make up a holistic health coaching plan. So bioindividuality is very important to me. And I look at every pet differently based on the symptoms they're exhibiting and who they are and what kind of household they live in. And yes, nutrition is a big part of what I do, like you, because we both agree it's the foundation of the house. If you're putting junk in, it doesn't matter what else you're doing. You're pushing a huge boulder up a mountain. Um, if you're putting good, fresh food with all of the amino acid profiles and all the vitamins and minerals, then the body is awakened. It's now getting everything it needs to function the way it's supposed to, to start healing. And yes, today, because we live in such a toxic world and the food and the water and the air and the grass and, you know, everything else, um, 5G is all incoming. Our, pet, our pet's bodies can't handle it all. It needs help offloading. And so there are things that I do whether it's homeopathy, whether it's frequency scanning, another beautiful form of energy medicine, whether it's carbon 60, which is a hundred more than a hundred times, almost 200 times stronger in antioxidant than vitamin C or vitamin E, but completely no toxicity level for humans or animals. Um, whatever it is that I think would be helpful for that particular animal, I do. Now, C60 can benefit all animals. Why? Because of the toxic world we live in, because every animal is exposed to it. And there's no, it's a do no harm supplement. Is frequency scanning right for everyone? Well, it's a great informational tool for, for every pet and every person. The reports that you get over multiple scans show you the out of balance frequencies that keep coming up before they're ever an issue, before they're ever something that you can diagnose. So, hey, why not know what's brewing? Um, but do I suggest homeopathy for every client? No, but I definitely start with nutrition for every client. So, yes. So I'm wondering if you would be willing to share a little bit about your dog, Sophie, because I know that has been difficult <laughs> for you lately and probably challenging as a pet health coach. I know for me, I, I think, you know, we, we get blinders, right. And I live with my dog and my cats and I might miss things. And so I feel like they're my hardest patients, <laughs> yes. not because of them, but because of me. Yeah. So as a pet health coach as well, I'm, I'm curious um, if you'd be interested in talking a little bit about your dog, Sophie, and, and what you've been through and maybe how you've looked at it through a different lens because you are a pet health coach. Yes, yes. And and I'm really, really glad you asked me about this because not only is it something that it's so important to me and so much heart work, um, but I've learned so much and on so many different levels that could be beneficial to your listeners. Um, so thank you for asking that. Um, Sophie is 13 and a half. She's a Portuguese Padango Pequeno, but she looks like a scruffy terrier mix. Not that much different than your little scruffy blonde who's adorable. Yeah. <laughs> um, and she has always been fed raw since she's a puppy. Um, she has behaved like a puppy right up until the beginning of April of this year. And then all of a sudden she had a cough. And for the first day or two, I noticed it, but I didn't put a lot of importance on it because I thought it was something that was just passing through. Um, I gave her echinacea and golden seal and some anuka honey and 
you know, things that I are antimicrobials that I would do if there's something brewing as a first line of defense. And it persisted. And then I noticed a tremor. I noticed she was rocking back and forth. And I was like, that worried me. So we went off to the vet and she got a complete physical. And this particular vet gave her a seal of approval, healthy dog. And I was like, hmm. I went, I, I'm very grateful and blessed that I have relationships with quite a few holistic vets, homeopathic vets, because of being in the pet space for years. And um, one of the vets that I worked with with a client is a homeopathic vet, Dr. Adriana Segrera out of New Orleans. And I reached out to her and we got Sophie on a remedy uh, for the tremors and she had an aggravation and she literally fell over. And so I, I antidoted it. Anytime your animal has an aggravation from a homeopathic remedy, have Vicks Vapor Rub in the house, any camphor type product, put it up to their nose, it immediately antidotes it. So we did, she was fine, but I didn't like the way she was acting. And so off we went to the emergency room where she was diagnosed with congestive heart failure. I'm so sorry. It was like an anvil over my head. Yeah. Came out of nowhere. Now, in 2019, through a routine checkup and echo, she was diagnosed with a heart murmur. It was a grade three out of six. They didn't feel we needed to do anything about it. And then I had her have another echo two years later, stayed at a grade three. The day after she was diagnosed with congestive heart failure, we had a flood in our house where we where we were renting. Oh. And yes, it it's the kind of setup of house where the glass sliding doors to the back um, is literally just eight feet away from the side of a detached garage. And the pitch of the roof, and there's no gutters, there were no gutters to put on mm -hmm. or drain pipes, is the exact pitch to go right on into at a big storm, go right in th through those sliding glass doors. And we had a flood through the whole house and it went under the baseboards. And, and I learned after that from the management company for this house that it had flooded when the owner lived there. So I have a very, very dear friend um, that was my chiropractor in New York, Dr. Daryl Joffrey, who, when he moved to Newport Beach, California with his family, he was in a moldy house and he didn't know it. And he and his little son got really sick and he learned a lot. And because he is a doctor and a celebrity nutritionist, he has relationships and he, he literally reached out to and ended up hiring the foremost mold expert in the world, this guy, Dr. Andrew Heilman or something like that. And so he got educated very quickly about mold and what it can do. And literally within 24 hours of a flood, all it takes is the moisture, drywall, or um, wood, and mold spores start within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So if this house flooded before I ever moved in, we were now about nine months in to living there. Um, this house had mold because nothing was ever remediated. Nothing was ever done. I subsequently learned that it flooded when they were staging the house before this guy ever bought it. So flooding went even further back. And one week to the day after it flooded, when I lived there, it flooded again. And after that second time, finally the owner came in, had somebody come in and put gutters and drain pipes in, but wouldn't do the proper remediation, didn't want to spend the money on the proper remediation. And three weeks after that first flood, I got sick. Mm. I started getting symptoms related to mold. So I got us all out. I moved us out of that house into a hotel, et cetera, and so forth. And the vets, Sophie's cardiologist, the homeopathic vet, and the integrative veterinarian um, all agreed that Sophie could very well have gone from a grade three heart murmur to full-on congestive heart failure by living in a moldy house for 10 months. We had a mold inspector come in. We saw there was mold. I did a, a very sophisticated mold test after 
he had the handyman come in and do the little work that he would agree to do. And that house was filled with mold enough for someone to get sick in that house. So this is the heartbreak. But here we are. So it was my job as her parent and as someone who knows a little bit more about health and has these relationships to come up with a protocol that could hopefully improve her situation. Because that day when she got diagnosed, the cardiologist sounded very dire. So I knew she had to go on pharmaceuticals. And I am not a pharmaceutical person. She had, I don't think, maybe in the early, early days before I knew what I knew later, she was on Flagyl once or twice, you no know, metronidazole, or maybe even Apoquel a couple of times years ago. Mm -hmm. But not in years had she been on anything. But I knew she had to go on the medications for heart failure because they work and she was in dire straits and we needed to stabilize her. But simultaneously, um, I also started her on a homeopathic remedy and I reached out to my old friend. Um, this is another way that I'm very grateful and blessed, Dr. Marty Goldstein, who was my vet in New York. And we became friends back in the 90s and we stayed friends. And I happened to run into him at Global and um, and then right after that, she was diagnosed. So I reached out to him and he turned me on to a vet that he trained, Dr. Jacqueline Ruskin, out of a VCA animal healing center in Pennsylvania that he used to send all of his cardiac patients to. She has a beautiful complementary meets conventional protocol. So she came onto the team too. And she put Sophie on a fantastic protocol of systemic enzymes and biocardio and heart and glandular, uh, heart and kidney glandular support, and a number of other wonderful things that if people go to uh, jodyltaish.com, they'll see my whole journey with Sophie, and it's all there in the blogs for people to look into for themselves and use if they want to if they find themselves in these situations too. And between the two, um, we had her on a great start. But as anyone who has dealt with congestive heart disease or heart failure um, knows, one of the medicines, the, the pharmaceuticals that you have to put them on is called Lasix, um, furosemide. It is a diuretic and it's a very strong diuretic. And while it does the job that it's meant to do really well, it destroys the kidneys. And it's almost a, you know, a given that once your pet is on furosemide for a short amount of time, those kidney values, that BUN is going to go up. And it did. So we now had to start mitigating kidney disease. And so that meant putting her on a kidney diet. Now, I'm not going to a Hills kidney diet, but I would go to Darwin's for a beautiful raw with organs and everything kidney diet that's lower in phosphorus, which is what they need for kidneys, and, um, and supplement it with other types of meat because they only do it in one meat. Um, some people with pets with heart disease may not realize, but chicken and pork are higher in phosphorus. So you want to sort of back off of those as much as you can, but there are plenty of other sources of protein that you could alternate, rotate with. Um, and then of course the organs, you know, more heart, more heart, <laughs> right? Because the heart is a tonic for the heart. So there was a diet and then there were kidney supports and we added some of those on between Dr. Segrera and Dr. Ruskin. And at one point back in just this past July, Sophie's BUN, the high level, the ceiling of normal is 27. Hers was greater than 130, which means that it didn't even create a number for it. 
um, that was scary. Yeah. And so with this whole protocol and the things that we've added, part of which was looking for natural ways to implement diuretics into her diet so that we could wean her off of this heinous Lasix. And that was parsley and dandelion and red clover tea that goes into, you can hear Sophie in the background right now, that goes into her meals twice a day. Um, long, long story short, we just had another echocardiogram, her third, the first one since the end of May last week, and another blood level for her kidney values, first one since mid-July with that horrible reading. And her BUN went from over 130 down to 80. It's still very high, but it's heading in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Her creatinine, which doesn't elevate until 75% of the kidneys are failing and had mm -hmm. elevated to 2.76 in July with a high of normal of being 1.8. Now is at 1.9. So it's only 0.1 off of normal, high normal. And her echocardiogram showed the chambers of her heart shrinking and the pressure going down. She's mm -hmm. still high, yeah. moving in the right direction. And they also did an x-ray of her lungs, her chest, no fluid, no fluid in her lungs, no fluid around her heart, no fluid in her abdomen. So this was do a dance type of news for us yeah. because this beautiful, large, you, you should see my kitchen counter, Jessica, it is full of stuff. This huge protocol for Sophie seems to be working. And how homeopathy played a part in this. Yes, early on, um, Dr. Segrera and I worked at a remedy for her that gave her more pep. Very early days, literally when she was just diagnosed. But, and this is super exciting. Um, somewhere along the way, probably now about two and a half months ago, she out of the blue developed incontinence and she had already been on the diuretic and the other medications for, you know, three months, two, three months. So it wasn't that. And we couldn't quite figure out what it could be. And we were worried that maybe it was kidney related. Um, so I started doing some research on my homeopathic digital program. And I came across a remedy that is almost rare. Um, it's not very well known and it's not used very much. It's called alcoholis and it's made from ethyl alcohol, but of course there's no more ethyl alcohol left in it. Um, it is being used more and more, more by Indian homeopaths as a bridge for alcoholics to come off of alcohol. So when I looked into the symptoms of alcoholis, what it would create in a healthy person. The mind symptoms, the mania and all that stuff didn't match with Sophie, but a lot of the heart symptoms did. Mm -hmm. This was before the incontinence started. The heart symptoms matched. Even the tremor that Sophie has in her front legs, you know, the tremors went away here. It, I re realized it wasn't neurological. It was more, her heart was beat so heavy, hard, which has come down. So that's subsided. But the heart symptoms, some of them matched. The tremors, some of them matched. So I tried it. I, I went to Dr. Segrera and we talked about it. And she said, that's really interesting. She said, in 30 some odd years, I've never used it. But and she's a homeopathic veterinarian. Mm -hmm. But it does look interesting. Try it. And she told me how to dose it. And I did. And we got some love from it. And then time passed. And then the incontinence developed and I went back and I looked at alcoholics again and wouldn't you know it, there is an incontinence symptom under alcoholics. So I checked again with Dr. Segrera because, you know, I want to be really responsible and, and I'm not a vet and this is congestive heart failure we're talking about. And she said, yeah, try it. So I did. 
we did another like three doses, 15 minutes apart, you know, liquid dose for two days, no incontinence. And this is a dog that was peeing on the pad, on the bed, wherever she was, probably about four times in a day. Mm. A dog that never did this before her whole life. Um, no incontinence for two days. And then she had what I now see after the fact was an aggravation. The third day, she peed twice in the house, but then something else happened at about midnight that night. She was on my bed and she sat up and she looked at me strangely as if something was going on inside her body. And then I noticed, because I take her resting respiratory rate every day to just make sure she's in normal range. I noticed a pounding, right? And so I took it and it was high and I called the emergency room and I'm on with the emergency vet and within seconds, it comes down. I retake it while I'm on the phone. It's normal. She settles back down and the emergency vet says, okay, it's normal. She settled. You can bring her in, but you can also just watch her. We're here all night. And I chose to watch her. She slept through the night and that was the end of the incontinence. And that was the end of the, and any incidents like that. So about a month and a half, two months later, she had one day of incontinence, another dose of Alco, gone and hasn't come back. So this is the incredible beauty of homeopathy. When you get it right, you get it right. It works. It yeah. really works. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And it's exciting to me that I now know for Sophie, bioindividuality, that if this incontinence comes up again, there's a good chance that one dose of alcoholis is going to handle it. And the other work that it could be doing in the background for her heart, who knows? Maybe that was part of what is helping to heal her. And I am very, very hopeful that I will be able to wean her off of Lasix and then be able to wean her off of the other medications piece by piece, one by one, and will hopefully heal my baby. So mm -hmm. it is oftentimes a village. It takes a village and it takes being open to different things. Yes, we talked about on my path podcast, you know, verify, 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 verify. Um, and I do my research too, of course. Um, but sometimes it takes a village and it takes conventional meets complementary when we're mm -hmm. our strongest as a bridge. The way Dr. Ruskin says it is, the pharmaceuticals are like crutches. You need them until you're able to take them off and go on your walker and then take that off and walk. So that's Sophie's story. She is bouncy. She is doing really well for a dog with congestive heart failure. And um, I'm keeping my my tribe posted on how it goes. Oh, my goodness. I know yeah, she yeah. is. I'm just, I'm thank thank you for sharing her story. Um, thank you for asking. I know it was very long winded, but I hope that parents have gotten some value. Absolutely. And I think one of the biggest things that I hope people take away is that complementary medicine that, that you're talking about where, you know, Eastern meets Western and we utilize both for what they're good for. That's right. Versus just here's a bunch of pharmaceuticals, keep your dog on them for the rest of their life. Who knows what that quality of life is even going to be because of the pharmaceuticals, yada, yada. Because I think people like you and I, we oft, especially on social media from the average pet parent, from certainly veteran, a lot of veterinarians, we get a lot, like there's a lot of misinformation going around where people think that we are just completely anti- pharma, anti-veterinarian. And that is not at all the case. It's not like, 
I'm going to sit here and tell never, ever, ever use pharmaceuticals, but oh, now there's something wrong with my dog and I'm going to use pharmaceutical. Like that's not how this works. <laughs> no, it's not. To me, pharmaceuticals, if you can handle something naturally and not jeopardize your dog's well-being, um, that's my go-to. In a case where you've got an animal with a disease and you're in a crisis where a pharmaceutical is going to work fast to stabilize, well, you'd have to be crazy to say, no, I'm not going to put a pharmaceutical. You'd have to be nuts. So that's would be my go-to. Um, and sometimes your dog is suffering so much that you need, they're not, it's not life-threatening, but you need that instant relief of a pharmaceutical as a bridge while you're doing the natural medicine, the complementary medicine, so that you can taper off, wean, wean off, and your dog at least is not suffering. They don't understand, right? You know, whether it's pain or they're ripping themselves up or whatever it might be, sometimes you need a bridge. And I think what you're trying to say too is we need to be open to what's best for the animal. And that is the main thing. It's really all about them. Well, I thank you uh, again for coming on. I think that's a perfect place to to stop that it really is all about them and what that individual animal needs. Yeah. And keep keep your mind open, keep your heart open for knowing what that is. Yes. So Jody, where uh, where can people find you, your website, social media? I'm sure they're all gonna want to start start following you and and hearing a little bit more about what you have to say. And certainly, as you were saying, um, read your blogs about Sophie. Thank you. Um, my site is Jody J O D Y L Teich T E I C H E dot com, and um, I'm also Jody Teich Jody L Teich on LinkedIn, and um, on Facebook and Instagram. On TikTok, I am the pet health at the pet health expert, and. Uh -huh. You can find me there. Wonderful. Well, thank you again, Jody. And guys, make sure you yeah. go give her a follow and um, just think about. I, I really hope, if nothing else, people do take away the the complementary medicine part because that really is, I think, where the the key is, especially with pet health coaches, is complementary medicine and helping people with whatever their veterinarian has given them hmm. and saying, okay, let's start here. This is, if this is what your dog needs right now, let's start here. And how can we boost this? How can we make this better? How can we see if we can get off of the pharmaceuticals on down the road? Like that's yeah. really what, that's where it's at. Yeah, especially if your pet's in a crisis, people get scared. They don't want to lose them, right? So they tend to take everything that their vet says and just do it, do it all, do it all, do it all. And yes, that might be important to do, but don't stop there, right? Yes. Look further in, for ways to shore up what those pharmaceuticals are doing to your pet's body because your pet's already trying to fight something. Mm -hmm. And also that can hopefully help heal whatever it is they are trying to fight. So absolutely be open. Yes. And we're here to listen. Oh, awesome. Well, guys, thank you so much for listening today. Make sure to give your pets some extra love from me and Jody today. And I will yes, talk to please. you. <laughs> I will talk to you next week. Thanks, Jess. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode. And please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos in my online dog training, 
The Furry Family Coach. Just go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside. Ow, ow.